In the wild tracts of the Pacific Northwest of America, men are now out to try to kill the ape man. Indeed, is this uniquely film of Bigfoot, the Yeti of the United States? Is this the footprint of the abominable snowman of the Himalayas? Lord Hunt of Everest fame is a believer. Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 and inventor of the communication satellite. Now in retreat in Sri Lanka, after a lifetime of science, space and writing, he ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. It may seem incredible that creatures like large man-apes can still exist in the modern world. Yet the evidence for this is now quite considerable. It's in the high valleys around Mount Everest that the Yeti, the abominable snowman of the Himalayas, seems most vivid. For the Sherpas of the high mountains, there are no doubts. The Yeti is woven into their rituals and their lives. How would you like to turn on your radio tomorrow morning and hear... Mondo Diablo. I know some of you guys will listen to this and want to pull your hair out, and the rest of you will be sub-geniuses. I think what makes me post stuff like this is a little unfocused rage and resentment. It's also a little bit that I loved this kind of 14 stuff when I was a little kid. One of the big reasons I came into my atheism was that I channeled my skepticism onto this kind of thing, the kind of thing I love to read about already. You might think that because I live in the Pacific Northwest that I would have been saturated with Bigfoot lore. Well, there was a lot of it in the 70s. I think people were really turned on by the idea then. There is at least one shop that I know of on a Cascade Mountain Pass that is a Bigfoot museum. I've been there. There's also the seven-foot Bigfoot that lived in our home for a time. My mom and dad made a life-size Bigfoot out in our driveway out of chicken wire, burlap, and glue and a lot of brown paint for my mother's summer reading program at the public library where she was the children's librarian. She had a contest. Whoever could come up with the best name for her Sasquatch would win a big stack of books as long as you joined the reading program. There were a lot of names like Harry and Stinky and Billy Bigfoot and stuff. The name they finally settled on was Sacagawea Sasquatch, the one female name, the one Native American name, perfect for the Northwest, really brilliant. I'm pretty sure that many of my classmates were convinced of the reality of Sasquatch, although if I pressed them now on Facebook, I'm sure they'd deny it. I just have to ask this one question, though. If sub-genius mutants are evolved from the Yeti, why... Why are there still Yeti?
Kunjo Chumbi is the headman of the Kumjong village. He has seen the Yeti. In the monastery above the village, he keeps what he believes to be its scalp. Preserved as a relic in a box. With some assurance, he imitates the Yeti's cry. That cry is listened to in fear by the Sherpas. Six years ago, Lakpa Damani heard it close by. A Yeti came and attacked me and threw me in the river. 
His face was very black and he looked like a very old man. I was unconscious for a couple of hours. When I woke up, I saw the Yeti had killed some yaks and a cow. She says uh, the Yeti, Yeti had picked up and threw her into the river. Her. The Yeti looms throughout the myths and legends of the Nepalese people. On the homosexual lobby front, the city of Berkeley, California, they are going to hold the first annual bisexual Pride Day. Now, we've been dealing with gay Pride Days here in America. We're boycotting Home Depot because they celebrate Gay Pride Month and they get involved in these gay Pride parades. Now, for the very first time, there's a city, Berkeley, California, that is going to host a bisexual Pride Day. And then you start wondering, well, what comes next? Is there going to be a transgender Pride Day? Will there be an incest Pride Day? Will there be a pedophilia Pride Day? Will there be a bestiality Pride Day? What's coming? Because as we've said, look, once you cross the threshold of one man, one woman, there is no place to stop. There is no place uh, to stop. Once you decide to treat homosexual behavior, which is sexually aberrant behavior, once you decide to treat it as normal and as a normal alternative to heterosexual behavior, there simply is no place to stop. That was the only way you could Yes, nostalgia makes shitty things seem good Makes shitty things seem Dunkaroos and handy snacks In your lunchbox every day You got sick of them at the time But look how excited you just got When I just said their name Hey, remember that movie Blank Check? Released around the holiday season. You'd watch ten minutes now before you realize you've got one star for a reason. Plus the never-ending story. Nowadays you wish it would. Yes, nostalgia makes shitty things seem good. I apply not to skip it commercials That sure I have on SNCC Pretty much anything from 1996 Makes me feel violently sick Sure this song's not exciting Much to my regret But give it 15 years And hipsters will quote it on the internet Ace of Base still has a following Which I've never understood It's cause nostalgia makes shitty things seem So many shitty things Nostalgia makes shitty things seem
Desmond Doig, with Sir Edmund Hillary, led the biggest expedition to hunt for the Yeti. He found that the Sherpas had the most precise physical description of the creature. To the Sherpas, he's got a conical scalp, rather pointed ears, splayed nose, he's shaggy, uh, he's bald around the chest and his stomach, and has a fairly human face. He's very nasty tempered, very, very nasty indeed, and is known to rip people apart if he gets a chance. Doig's expedition wrote off the Yeti, wrongly, he now feels, as an oriental fantasy. I'm afraid our expedition was a great gaudy mess. Uh, any self-respecting Yeti would have kept way, way away from us. We had 600 coolies, we had about 200 Sherpas, and there were about 40 of us in the most beautifully designed and coloured anoraks. Our tents were all vividly coloured. We smelt different, we looked different, we behaved differently to the local people, and the smells of our cooking must have horrified everything in, within smelling distance. Well, the hard, rather soulless results of the expedition was that the Yeti didn't exist. Other expeditions have also failed to snare the abominable snowman. But for 50 years now, Westerners have continually been coming back with new testimony. Emil Wick is one of the world's most experienced mountain flyers. Two years ago, he was taking a party of Japanese tourists on a flight over Kanchenjunga. I saw on one of the hills some tracks I have never seen. to the Chamlang side, to the north, and uh, I wanted to follow also, but the lady which was sitting on my right seat said, Captain, very sorry for that, but uh, we paid the Kanchenjunga flight, and not a pleasure flight for you. A lot of yeah. African Americans, well many or some, are really, really struggling with, you know, the whole Romney, who's a Mormon candidate, and yeah. President Obama, who's a Christian, but yet supports gay marriage. What advice would you give them? They're not sure who to vote for. At this juncture, I've got to say this. I would support someone whose values line up with clear biblical mandates on the big issues of the day versus, well, I don't know who to vote for. I'll stay home then I'll let an anti-God, anti-church agenda go forth. Mm. That, my friend, is just like the old story of Nero fiddling while That's Rome right. burns. Right. Mm -hmm. And you think you're being real spiritual, but the reality is you're being foolish. Mm. And I personally am challenging people to vote marriage first, meaning find somebody in your local community who'll go back to Washington and protect marriage, and then vote your values. And uh, if you can vote for abortions and if you can vote uh, for the redefinition of marriage, mm -hmm. you want to vote for, um, you know, two men marrying or open a door for two women and three men and all kind of crazy stuff. If you can do that and the Holy Spirit can be with you in the ballot box, more power to you. I cannot vote for people that support those kinds of things. I got something to tell you, baby. Don't get mad this time. If you want my wiener, you give me ease all up in my mind. Baby, please want my wiener. Oh, want my wiener. Won't you just want my wiener? Cause he really don't feel right cold. Now listen here, sweet baby. I ain't no lying man. If you want my wiener one time, you'll want me to warm him again. Baby, please want my wiener. Oh, want my wiener. Won't you just want my wiener? Cause he really don't feel right cold. Says 
drum says it takes hot water. Baby, can't you see? But your heat, baby, is plenty warm enough for me. Baby, please warm my wiener. Oh, warm my wiener. Won't you just warm my wiener? Cause he really don't feel right cold. Baby, please warm my wiener. Now listen, yes, sweet baby. It ain't no fake. I'm begging you, baby, now just give your daddy one break. Baby, please warm my wiener. Oh, warm my wiener Won't you just warm my wiener Cause you really don't feel right cold Now listen here, yeah, sweet baby You know the time's growing old I don't want you warm half of my wiener I want you to warm him all Baby, please warm my wiener Oh, warm my wiener Won't you just want my wiener? Oh, he really don't feel right cold. In 1951, photographs of footprints were taken on the borders of Tibet by the late Eric Shipton and Dr. Michael Ward. There was no doubt about it, they were unlike anything that either Eric Shipton or I had ever seen or even imagined before. They were very clearly etched in the snow. The snow was about, I suppose, three inches deep uh, on top of hard ice. And you can see that there are five toes definitely outlined. The big toe here, second there, third there, fourth there, and you can see a small toe there. You can see that the actual track itself is very, very clear cut. Uh, and you can also see that over here at the heel, it's obviously a place where there has been a lot of weight there, and I suggest that probably what happened was that the animal put down its heel there and walked. The dimensions of the print are approximately 12 inches long and probably something of the order of 5 to 6 inches wide. I don't think there's any possibility of there being distortions of other animals' tracks at all. The various, various um, ideas have been put forward that this one, for instance, might have been the uh, the imprint of two feet, one on top of the other, but I just don't think that's on at all. I just don't think that's possible. This print was photographed in the Dud Kosi Valley in 1978 by the leader of the team which first conquered Everest, Lord Hunt. Uh, the creature had broken through some pretty heavy uh, crust on the snow. It was deep snow on a rather steep little slope. And the the creature was a heavy one because he'd broken through hard crust on which, as far as we were concerned, we could walk around without making any impression through the snow at all. Um, and uh, you could see through the snow, in the soft snow underneath the crust, the toe impression. I prophesied uh, before, la you know, before, that before 2011, I prophesied that God had seen decisions made from our White House that were anti-biblical and that we were going to come into a season of the greatest weather patterns and disasters we had seen. There was going to be floods and fires and more. It all happened. 2011, I believe, historically, was the worst year for weather-related disasters in our history. Oh, and I was mocked everywhere for that. Because they don't understand spiritual things. You understand right. spiritual right. things, Jim. So we've got to be prepared. Listen, we're going to have more weather disasters. It's going to come up worse and worse. It's not going to stop. We are still not pleasing God. So we have got to be prepared.
don't think they were bad tracks because the Sherpas, whenever I've talked to them about this, and uh, in fact when I've been with Sherpas seeing tracks, they have been quite emphatic that these are not theirs, that they are Yeti. In pictures taken by a French Jesuit priest, Abbe Bourdet, the toes again show very clearly. It is certainly not an ape, nor a bear, because a bear has claws, and this creature has not. So I think it is a special kind of animal uh, that we don't really know anything about, because we don't have an exact description. But uh, I have spoken about it to some paleontologists, and they are rather inclined to believe that we are dealing with an animal from the pre-human ear, that is to say, one of our distant ancestors. The Outward Bound School at Owlswater is run by squadron leader Lester Davis, Royal Air Force. That's great. That's lovely. Good. That's well done. He was on the 1959 RAF expedition to the Kulti Valley when he too came across tracks in the snow. It sunk in about uh, five inches, high with cine cameras and things, weighing about 12 and a half stone, and only went in about one and a half inches. Oh, well, this thing is huge. Uh, the snow had been undercut by this fast glacier stream and I fell in. And I had held my camera above my head because it came up to my armpits before my feet touched the bottom. Well, I, it was icy cold and I scrambled out and uh, just beside these footprints and um, immediately uh, we suddenly realized this animal or yeti or whatever, it had just stepped out uh, with using only its two hind legs. And uh, the chaps of the British Museum, they said this establishes its height is about eight foot and its weight is about 60 stone. You probably heard the stories some of you watching may have been there and witnessed them, having amputated limbs restored in meetings. These are creative miracles. These aren't just healings. These are miracles. And there were uh, that kind of thing. And that some of, one of that, one friend of mine had part of a finger, his finger had been amputated r real short near his, uh, his knuckle. And his finger grew all the way back halfway through his fingerprint until he got interrupted. Those praying for him got interrupted, and it, that was as far, but he got almost all of his finger back in two joints and uh, through prayer. I mean, stuff like that. It was so awesome. Hey, why should I be on the Internet? Why? Well, by the time we're in college, the Internet will be our telephone, television, shopping center, and workplace. And it's already got more stuff in it than you could possibly imagine. In less than an hour, you can visit the planet Jupiter, take a tour of the Sistine Chapel, do research on the rainforest, get soccer scores for a team in Italy, chat with a friend in Australia, and I even found a recipe for cat food cupcakes. It is as much a part of the future as we are. Shouldn't everybody be on the internet? Yes! yes! Sightings of the Yeti by Westerners are rare, but in 1970 the English climber Don Willans was on his way to the conquest of one of the world's toughest mountains. Annapurna by the South Face. I heard what sounded like uh, bird cries from at the back of me. And uh, I looked at the Sherpa and he said, Yeti coming, Saab. So I whipped round, looked up the mountain, and I saw two black crows flying away and a black shape drop behind the ridge. Well, my first thoughts were, Christ, what, what do I do now? Grab the ice axe or what? What he did do was photograph the tracks. Next night it reappeared and he was watching it again. And then quite suddenly it was as almost as if I, as if it realised it, that it was being watched so to speak, quite suddenly it shot across the, the whole slope of the mountain. It must have traveled half a mile in a diagonal line downwards and it was obviously heading towards uh, a rocky cliff. 
for some rocky outcrop there. And uh, it disappeared into the shadow by the rocks. And uh, that was the last I actually ever saw of it. So how strong is the evidence? It is not beyond the bounds of possibility that uh, a creature like the Yeti does exist in some remote parts of the world. I personally now stick my neck out and say I, I'm a firm believer in the Yeti. I think it's a very strong case to answer. Um, uh, having eliminated bears in my own mind, I can find no other explanation but that there is an unidentified creature still to be discovered. You know, the billboards stay up forever unless somebody comes and buys the billboard. I mean, you can get a billboard to go on for several months even though you pay for a month. Those billboard companies are private. They're owned by private corporations. They can deny somebody the right to put up an offensive billboard. They don't have to. I mean, if, if they had two teenagers having sex, they wouldn't put that picture on because it would be repugnant to the people. They can also tell those atheists to take a hike. There's no First Amendment that says, uh, you know, the billboard companies have to put your atheist message up. So that's, forget, forget this First Amendment stuff. The, the government, maybe, is a different thing, but these are not government entities. And the billboard companies just want to make a buck in this case, and I think it's a mistake to put that kind of garbage in public view so the drivers look at it all day long. George Washington was a white man, Adams and Jefferson too. Abe Lincoln was a white man probably, and William McKinley, the whitest of them all, shot down by an immigrant in Buffalo, and the star fell out of heaven. I'm dreaming of a white president Just like the ones we've always had A real live white man who knows the score How to handle money or start a war Wouldn't even have to tell me what we were fighting for He'd be the right man if he were Everybody, I'm dreaming of a white president, someone whom we can understand, someone who knows where we're coming from, and that the law of the jungles, not the law of this land, deepest, darkest Africa, 1903. The little boy says, Daddy, I just discovered relativity. Big eclipse is coming, and I'll prove it. Wait and see. You better eclipse yourself out of here, son. Find yourself a tree. There's a lion in the front yard, and he knows he won't catch me. Well, how many little Albert Einsteins cut down while in their prime? How many little Ronald Reagans gobbled up before their time? I don't believe in evolution. But it does occur to me. What if little William Howard Taft had to face a lion, or God forbid, climb a tree? Where would this country be? I'm dreaming. Boom, 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 boom. These things have never been this bad. So it won't run a hundred and ten seconds flat. So I won't have a pretty jump shot or be an Olympic acrobat. So I won't know much about global warming. Is that really where you're at? You won't be the brightest, perhaps, but he'll be the whitest. And I'll vote for that. Whiter than this, yes. Whiter than this, yes. Wider than this, yes. Wider than this, oh yeah. Bigfoot spread right across the northwest United States. This is Washington State. Sergeant Larry Gamash was driving home one night with his family and sister-in-law, Kathy. I noticed quite a distance ahead of me uh, uh, an object move out of the dense forest uh, towards the clearing between the, the forest and the highway. And it started to slow then. 
And as I got a little bit closer, I noticed it was walking very much like a human. Uh, arms down at its side, swinging just in a, in a normal walking gait. It just got bigger and bigger as we went closer to it. And it was hairy and just didn't look... Well, I wanted to close my eyes, but you didn't want to. You want to look. You want to see what you're going to see, but you, yet you don't. The most impressive thing was it was the human features in the way that it walked. The fact that the, the, the facial area wasn't really covered with a lot of hair. Um, the eyes, you know, seemed normal as I as I looked through the windshield at him. And the height, you know, the size, just the sheer physical size of it, it had to been, in comparison to what I can relate back to today, is seven maybe seven and a half feet tall because I had to physically look up through the windshield to, to see the uh, uh, the face and, and, and the head and I was in a pickup truck so they sit up quite a bit higher than a car so it, w it was at least seven feet maybe 300 350 pounds Bigfoot now emerges often enough to get on television news this is KFYR Bismarck North Dakota it's here in and around Little Eagle South Dakota where there have never before been any sightings of the so-called Bigfoot or Sasquatch, where the people of this small community are now becoming believers. There have been 17 sightings of the creature in the past month. The latest sighting was at the Shooting Bear residence on a bluff overlooking the town. Last Tuesday night, Hannah Shooting Bear saw the creature from her house while it was looking in the window of her daughter's trailer about 30 yards away. It's a chicken sandwich. It's a piece of white meat chicken between two pieces of white bread. White bread. White bread. It's also a milkshake. Now, we're going to go and have demonstrations over that. But you know something, uh, and Terry, I was reading today in Leviticus, which is the law of the Old Testament. White bread. But uh, it lays out the reasons why a land will vomit out its inhabitants. And it goes through a category of stuff that we're calling constitutional rights, you know, yes. killing babies, offering them to Molech. And uh, it says it is an abomination for a man to lie with a man as with a woman. That's what it says. That is the moral law that God set forth. And now we've got people in a university petitioning because somebody says, I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. And I defy, well, I defy, I defy these homosexuals to bring forth a baby from that part of the anatomy which they concentrate on. I mean, when that happens, I will change everything I'm saying. Until that happens, I wish those, those demonstrators would shut their mouths.
Elderly Hannah was the only one to see the creature, but her son-in-law is reported to have fired several rifle shots into the air after it had moved off. What do you think they ought to do about him around here? Kill him. He might hurt somebody. Despite that recommendation, the Bigfoot hunters want to keep him alive. Their plan is to lure him into an area where they can either take his picture or shoot him with a tranquilizer. They believe in the notion suggested by an outsider that Bigfoot is attracted to menstruating women. This bait consisted of some used feminine articles. Dennis Newman reporting from Little Eagle, South Dakota. Across the mountains on the Pacific coast in Washington state, veteran hunter and Rockingham County police officer Kenny Cooper was driving along this road when he heard a weird noise. I was coming down north on this road here and I heard some noise screaming back in here. And all the time I was going along, he was screaming. And everybody in Walking County could hear it because I did have the police mic outside. So, uh, and the noise that was coming from that creature is what well, was on the recorder here. took that recording, we sent it into the lab to have it analyzed, and it came back that there's no metallic noises in the recording indicating that it wasn't made by some kind of a machine. And they said there's no voice, uh, no human has vocal cords enough to throw the high pitches and the low pitches at the same time that was coming from them. But it was Bob Gimlin and his friend Roger Patterson out trekking at Bluff Creek in Northern California who were the ones to suddenly find a large hairy creature appear in front of them. Now Henry County's talked about as being square The biggest thing to happen is the ball game's there I guess that's why they called it such a big event I'm talking about the Dunreath Railroad accident Now Dunreath lies a little bit inside the line A train derailed and started fires and for a time It looked like the little town would blow away But the Henry County heroes fought it night and day Sheriff Badgett and his men stood in the bitter cold But the flame from the Dunreath fire singed and burned their clothes And I was there to fight the fire like all the rest The broken glass, the spreading flames, the tangled mess I saw my brother fall and thought I'd say a prayer but through the grace of God it only singed his hair Men who thought that they were enemies before Fought side to side to save the town and even more Each one helped the other until he was spent And not a life was lost in the Dunreath accident if you are ever passing through that little town Take the time to stop a while and look around Notice all the vacant lots all cleared away And visualize the fire that burned the town away And the world read about the accident for many days See the sun going down and the eyes in his hand. See the
they actually had a loaded cine camera with them. We came around a bend in the creek, and there stood a big, hairy, human-like creature. It appeared to be between six and seven feet tall. The creature looked at us for a few seconds, turned and walked slowly away. And uh, it was kind of in a loamy type soil, left good footprints. It walked directly away from us at a, just a slow stroll, just like a man would be walking away from something downtown. It never did break into a run. Well, the animal appeared to be a female due to the fact that it appeared to uh, have mammary glands. And the thing walked very agile, very fluently, and it had huge bulky muscles. An overall description, it looked like a huge hairy human being. English and Russian scientists have analyzed this film very carefully and they've concluded that the stride is quite unhuman and be very difficult for a man to imitate. However, I think we showed in the beginning of 2001 that skilled mimes can make completely convincing ape men. So this is not proven. But the Patterson film did have backup evidence, which is now in the hands of Dr. Grover Krantz. Here there are 54 million women eligible to vote. Two and a half million more women than men. Enough to decide the whole election. And as November 6th draws near, you women are doing a lot of thinking about a lot of important things. For instance, you're thinking about the cost of living. You want to see living expenses stay at a reasonable level. You want your family budget to be protected against inflation. You're thinking about your family. You want to be as sure as you can that you will all go on living together in our present happiness and prosperity, in an America at peace. You're thinking about your children's future. You want them to grow up under the best possible conditions in terms of schools, health, and general welfare. And because they believe he represents their best hope of achieving these things, the women of America are making their choice for president. Bob? But suppose we ask some of them what they think about the coming election. My main reason for voting for Bob? is because I believe in his sincerity. Uh, I don't feel that he is furthering his own interests, but he is furthering the interests of the country and the people. I feel he's a very big man which is needed for that position and also because he has not been and is not what I consider a politician. I'm interested in Bob and this is my one big reason why I'm interested in Bob. As a woman and future homemaker and mother in America, the type of man that I want to be president is a man that I and my family and my children and those around me can look up to and respect. I think that President Bob that sort of man. Inflation. We're not going to have that in the next four years if we vote right with Bob. I'm voting for Bob because I feel that he is a God-fearing man and I think that's essential in any leader, especially the leader of our country. Uh, I think that Bob has shown how he feels about the average working man. He's uh, given us the minimum wage law the changes he's made in Social Security. And uh, I think in another four years, he'll uh, do even more than that for us. I'm going to vote for President Bob. Because he represents the things in which I believe. I like his philosophy of the dignity of man. And I also believe that he's a sincere, honest, and high caliber person. He has a smile that could prove only one thing, and that is honesty. So much of our future rests with the women of our country. They are the homemakers. The whole family unit revolves around them. Everything that affects the family's welfare affects them first. 
and everything in the family's life benefits from their influence. They do the family buying. They see that everybody in the family circle is well clothed and well fed. But beyond this, they are the custodian of its values and aspirations for the future. In their hands lies the training of our young people, to whom they pass on the rich heritage of our nation, its love of peace and justice, and its passion for freedom. The women of our country swept Bob. into office four years ago. They will probably decide the election this time. And they like Bob. And here's somebody else they like, too. Bob. Beloved Connie. Whose smile and modesty and easy natural charm make her the ideal first lady. Let's keep our first lady in the White House for four more years. November 6th, vote for Bob. The National Citizens Bob Nixon have presented this message to all thinking voters, regardless of party affiliation. <laughs> evidence is the uh, the plaster cast that I've got here of the uh, footprints I'll show you some of them here for instance here is a track that was uh, cast right after Roger Patterson made his movie in Northern California the imprint of the foot not only pressed into the ground but also in pushing off it raised a mound of dirt in the middle of the uh, footprint and this indicates that it was a flexible foot and a rigid fake could not have made this that's not as convincing as this other track. This is a 17-inch track that was picked up in northeastern Washington state. And this is what was evidently a crippled individual, because here we have two tracks of the same individual. You're looking at the bottom of the feet. And this right foot is crippled. <clears throat> it is distorted, lengthwise, bent, missing one toe. And most critically, the two bulges on the outside of the foot represent spaces between bones and if this had been just a gigantic human foot or some kind of fake like that these bulges and the bone spaces should have been set farther back the fact of where they are indicates that this is a foot designed with different leverage a longer heel shorter forepart which is exactly what would have to be done to make a foot that would lift an 800 pound animal homesteader Grover Kiggins and his daughter Millie saw evidence that Bigfoot has a stride to match the size of its feet. They were out near their farm in Oregon when they saw some tracks. We measured them. Dad had his rule. We measured them when we went up. He stepped 67 and a half inches, which is a long step. And then when he went down, he came down the road, and when he stopped at the edge of the road, he went off the road into the timber, down into the rough brush and timber 
he stepped seven feet when he stepped down in there. And uh, I uh, followed him for a little ways down in there, but I decided I didn't want to go down in there and see what made those tracks. And in one place, he come to a fence, about a four-foot barbed wire fence. He just stepped over that like it wasn't there. I had to crawl through or under. <laughs> I think Bigfoot is an animal that we already know from the fossil record. I'll show you a specimen here. This is a cast of the lower jaw of a what we call the Gigantopithecus. This lived in China about half a million to a million years ago. I'd like to compare this with the gorilla. This is a cast of a gorilla's skull, so you can see the size of this thing. This was an animal that probably weighed about 400 pounds in the wild. And just looking at the lower jaw alone, what's perhaps most interesting is from the underside of the jaw, there is a difference. In the gorilla, the two sides of the jaw spread only modestly as you go back because the gorilla's neck is so far behind the lower jaw. If that neck were moved forward, the jaw would have to widen to make space. In the Gigantopithecus, the jaw is spreading at a much wider angle, and the only obvious reason for that is the neck is in the way, and that means the head was set on top of the body instead of hung forward, and it's a fair presumption that this was an erect bipedal animal. So we end up with the description of Gigantopithecus being a, uh, an erect biped, standing perhaps eight feet tall, weighing about 800 pounds, and being uh, presumably covered with hair. This was too early to have cultural activity. Probably no more intelligent than an ape. And uh, this, of course, is an exact description of the living Sasquatch. Personally, I'd be less skeptical of ape men if there weren't so many of them. It's hard to believe that something like Bigfoot could remain undetected in America. If anyone gave me a hundred dollars to bet on it, well, I'd put 40 on the Yeti, 10 on Bigfoot, and I keep the 50 for myself. And now, an original rant from Pissed Off Hellbound Alley. The scenario is as such. Two young lovers lie in each other's arms. They are at bliss. The girl begins to talk as they tend to do. Mmm, you treat me so nice. Not like the others. I don't think I've ever been treated so well as when I'm with you. The man sighs in post-coital bliss. <sighs> yes, she continues. Which makes it all the worse for you when I dump your ass for another manipulative jerk. Such is the meme that is passed around the web, a particular favorite of men's rights websites. In fact, you can find this story under the name, Women Secretly Want to Be Abused. I decided to criticize a comic that's been going around Facebook for this. I said, let me shorten this comic for you. Abuse. She wanted it. Why go to the trouble of treating a girl well if she just wants you to treat her badly? It's not like we haven't seen this before. Watch television sometime. It's a fucking trope. Try Google. Go ahead. Google Women Want to Be Abused. Count the number of hits. I was confronted by some rage coming from the males. The subject of the story, right? After all, this story is about his pain, not hers. And that's what I was told. It's real. So many of their friends have gone through this terrible story. It's abusive. It's boyfriend abuse. It's his story. Also, it's just a comic, and I shouldn't think about it further. Sometimes a comic is just a comic. But also, the pain he goes through is just as bad as any problem she might have because he was abused. Except not. Show me a guy who says he was a fucking prince in shining armor to his girlfriend who left him for an asshole, and I'll show you a woman who says her ex-boyfriend was an asshole. Don't flatter yourself, guys. But deconstruction, it's, it's just the building of straw men, he says. And I'm blowing everything out of perspective. You know, like the comic story where the guy thinks he was the best man his girlfriend could ever have possibly have ever fucked. No, no one could treat her as well as he could. No one could love her like that. Sounds like one hell of a fairy tale. And the hero of that tale is Mr. Nice Guy, who always finishes last. He could have been her savior, and they would have lived happily ever after. If 
if only she would stop being so selfish with her bullshit feelings like she deserves to be treated like shit. Have you ever heard a guy recommend that women with low self-esteem make good girlfriends? It's almost like they've forgotten that half their friends were abused by one. Speaking of fairy tales, we all know who the hero is in each one. It's not Cinderella, the abused girl. It's not Red Riding Hood, the girl who doesn't know when a guy's a rapist. It's Prince Charming, or the heroic huntsman. Those are the fairy tales we grow up with. If we want to identify with a hero, we have to adapt and identify with a guy. Guys are told stories of men who have no time for their abused princess daughters because they have kingdoms to run, like Cinderella's absent father. Identifying with a female in a story, well, that's crazy talk. Oh, by the way, sorry for the ableist language. Unfortunately, if you wish me to remove such words from my vocabulary, I'm afraid I'm unable to accommodate your request, but that's another topic for another day. So, this is why I want to question this comic and these stories. If this is anywhere close to being real, and actually only one man's story about one incident, which absolutely has no relation to memes and myths spread among young privileged males today, then we have to admit there are two characters in this story, and, uh, so sorry for you guys, her story actually exists, and is probably more interesting. And, if you insist on having a pain contest between the two, ask yourself this. Which one thinks he deserves it? That poor sucker who will never trust again? Or the one who returns to abuse again and again because she's internalized something that's been coming at her since she was in her crib and will continue after she's fucking dead? The best bullshit email I get about this goes on the show. Thanks for listening. To hear more, be sure and visit hellboundalley.blogspot.com and go ahead and follow me on Twitter at Mondo Diablo. See you next time.